The NFL season is finally here, so make sure you're ready with NFL Sunday Ticket and YouTube TV. It gives you the most live NFL games all in one place, exactly what you need to make your Sundays more magical. Sign up today at youtube.com slash Sunday Ticket. Local and national games on YouTube TV, NFL Sunday Ticket for out-of-market games excludes digital-only games. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at midmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. This episode is brought to you by Honda. When you test drive the all-new Prologue EV, there's a lot that can impress you about it. There's the class-leading passenger space, the clean, thoughtful design, and the intuitive technology. But out of everything, what you'll really love most is that it's a Honda. Visit honda.com slash EV to see offers. Hey there, Duke fans. Welcome to episode number 62 of DBR Bites. It is Wednesday, September 25th, 2024. I am Donald Wine. I'm your host for this episode. We have some basketball content, or at least some some news to share with you this afternoon. We're calling it a bite, but as you probably know, we get a little long-winded when it comes to basketball because we love overanalyzing, don't we? Jason Evans. Jason Evans, my man, is on the pod. Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, you give us five, four or five lines of, of a tweet, and we will run with it for a half hour. <laughs> That's literally what we're about to do. But before yes. we do that, Jason, real quick, I do want to make a note today. As, as I mentioned, September 25th, 2024, it is my brother's 40th birthday, Stephen Wine. Happy 40th, my man. Uh, hope you have a great day. Uh, he, I don't think he listens to the pod, or at least he hasn't told me he listens to the pod. He went to Texas, uh, so he's not yeah, obviously the, the biggest Duke fan, so there'd be no point to him for him to do this uh, incessantly other than to listen to our voices. But I hope he has a great day. September 25th, a very good day in the wine world. Uh, by the way, I, I find it's sort of funny in terms of who listens to the pod, um, because not, no one in my family listens to it, because... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, brothers, sisters aren't really aren't necessarily Duke fans. Even my sons don't listen to it, even though they are Duke fans. And here's the reason why. And I have I have other friends who who are Duke fans who don't listen. And all of them say to me, they're like, anytime I want to hear about what's going on with Duke, I can just call you and talk to you about it. That's my dad. Like, yeah. yeah, but my dad doesn't listen me, to podcasts. He just like, like you can he give just me a download. Them. Give me a download every now and then, huh? I have to do I have to do an episode with him every few days on Duke basketball, and I'm happy to do it uh, as long as as long as I possibly can. So but with that, let's get into the basketball news. We're going to start with some news that came out yesterday. We mentioned this as we were recording the schedule episode, which hopefully you have listened to by now, if not go back and listen to it. But as that was about to drop, uh, as we were about to record, John Rothstein, who is a, a college basketball insider of CBS Sports, had been tweeting throughout the day that he was at Duke and he had been participating. Uh, I guess they had a little bit of an open media day of some sort for some uh, of the national media. And John uh, Rothstein, actually, actually, I think that Rothstein was there on his own. They just sort of said, "Yes, you might have been there on his own." E- yeah. Yes. Either way, he, he also was... he also went and visited an NC State practice. He he sort of goes around the country and does this with some different teams. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he he does a tour where he I think he goes to he tries to get to like seventy six. Uh, uh, or something is it's a it's a weird number um but he gets right. to a ton of schools uh and talks about the team what he you know sees through their practice what he kind of envisions and as jason mentioned yesterday john rostein in just a few tweets said quite a lot uh so let's go through them uh real quickly and then we can overanalyze what he said again he was on campus yesterday took in a practice was able to see them scrimmage 
And the first thing I think we start off with is he has an early prediction on who the starting five will be for the Duke Blue Devils. And that starting five, in his mind, is going to be Tyrese Proctor, Conkinipple, Cooper Flagg, Mason Gillis, and Common Malawatch. He said he is not going to be surprised from this list. Of course, we've talked about Cooper Flagg for the last two years, and with and for good reason. And we've also talked about Conkinipple quite a bit this summer, as a lot of people who have gone to take in some of these practices that said Conkinipple has been the man in practice. John Rothstein said he would not be surprised if Con Knippel is Duke's second leading scorer behind Cooper Flagg, which I think is very interesting. And Jason, before you you jump in, he mentions also that he, quote, uses angles exceptionally well. He's always around the ball, and he's a throwback offensive player. That is the type of game that we have said uh, has been coming out of practice, that old man YMCA game. But it's been working for him, and it seems like, to a point, if he gets to, the, gets to a spot, he's almost unstoppable Jason yeah so I want to go back to Rothstein's comment about the starting five before we talk about Con Knippel a little bit more and again Rothstein said Proctor Knippel Flag Mason Gillis and Common Malawatch um I think that what happened here may have been and a lot of people have said like wait a second what what happened to Caleb Foster (laughs) how is Caleb Foster not in this starting lineup I think that here's what happened Uh, What Rothstein saw was a scrimmage that Duke ran and those five guys ran together on uh, probably the white, the white team. Yeah. Yeah, In that scrimmage, we've seen some footage from that scrimmage and we're going to talk about it. And, and one player who stands out in that footage a little bit later, but I think he saw those five guys playing together and he went, Oh, these must be the starters. And I'm going to tell you why I think John Rothstein may have been wrong about this. I think he's wrong because I suspect that John Shire plans to play Tyrese Proctor and Caleb Foster 40 minutes at point guard. I don't think there's anyone else who's in the running to really play point guard. Maybe a little tiny bit of Sion James, but now, now by point guard, you mean the guy who is, whose role is specifically to be the distributor, not necessarily who brings up the basketball. Cause as we've talked about, you're going to see Cooper right. flag, bring up the basketball. You'll see Mason Gillis and some other guys bring up the ball when they're in the game. Right. But I think I sort of feel like point guard and center are two very specific positions. The other positions are much more fluid, but those are two very, very specific roles on the team. And if you're John Shire and you want Caleb Foster to get minutes and get time as a point guard for the times that Tyrese Proctor is not in the game. Well, if you're going to run a scrimmage, you probably don't want Tyrese Proctor and Caleb Foster on the same team together because then Caleb Foster is not going to get his point guard minutes. So I think that for this scrimmage and probably for most of the scrimmages that they do, Shire is putting together a lineup that does not include Caleb Foster because he needs Caleb Foster to be the point guard for the B team or whatever you want to call it, the backup team. And I think that may be one reason why you saw this starting five that doesn't include Caleb Foster that has surprised people so much. Now the question then becomes, okay, well, so who is who has replaced Caleb Foster? Is it Con Knippel? Is it Mason Gillis? You know, are they, you know, is Flag playing the three or the four? All that other kind of stuff. I don't know those answers. But I believe that when it comes time for Duke to roll out their starting lineup, I still think Caleb Foster is going to be in it. And I think John Rothstein's prediction of Proctor, Knippel, Flag, Gillis, and Malawatch, I think that's not going to be Duke's starting lineup. I I I when it when I say early prediction, and when he says early prediction, one he has the he has the he reserves the right to be wrong, um, and he might Absolutely. he might very well be, and you might you talk about one position, you know, again, Con Knipple may not start, Mason Gillis may not start, Cooper Flag's probably the the surest thing, right? And, and and after that, maybe Tyrese Proctor, but after that, you have a couple of guys here who could again the competition aspect of things may drive that as we get towards November. Some guys, and we get a couple of, you know, countdown and we get the two uh, exhibition games under our belt. Maybe John Shire goes in a different way or maybe, you know, something happens where a guy emerges. Uh, We'll talk about one in just a second that prompts him to make a different call about who trots out for that first game of the regular season against Maine. He also is doing this, ladies and gentlemen, on day two of op- of the first you know week of practice. So again, this is not something where they've really established anything, and I'm sure they're still looking at combinations as they go along. Now, I will say this: uh, there was another tweet that I thought was interesting from 
John Rossing. It, it was a string of tweets that he had, and, and I think he had a video, which, Jason, I'll let you get to the video in a second. But before we do that, I did want to talk about the spacing. And he mentioned that John Rothstein or John Rothstein mentioned that Duke is making a concerted effort to improve the Blue Devil spacing because the idea is everybody and their mother who plays Duke is going to go after one guy, Cooper Flag. They're going to double and triple team Cooper Flag, and double teams aren't going to be well to do if Con Knipple, Darren Harris, Caleb Foster, Mason Gillis, those type of guys are regularly making threes. We've talked about how John Shire has wanted this team to be fast. He's wanted them to play defense. And then he's also wanted team this team to shoot threes. Well, if they shoot threes, well, it's hard to leave your man unchecked to go guard a double team, a Cooper flag, who's getting the ball in the post or a common mile watch or a Millie Brown. Who's getting the ball in the post. It's just going to be impossible to do that. So, there's been a big emphasis on hitting open threes. You've seen that in the in the uh, scrimmages, or at least the videos that have gone on social media. I will say there was one that went out the other day, or I think it was yesterday, about Darren Harris going eight for eight from three in the scrimmage. Yo, uh, we love that. those numbers. Hey, repeat that. Repeat eight for that eight. number. Eight for eight. And remember, Darren Harris was was missing for most of the summer because he re- he had that broken hand that he was recovering for. Seems like it has recovered quite well, and the shot has not uh been affected by it but jason also when we talk about this there is that video he, it, he basically kind of summarized everything in like a minute's worth of a video for social media and he talked of course about cooper flag tell him what he mentioned about cooper flag and of course his potential for this season yeah so what john rothstein said was effortless effortless is the best way to describe cooper flag um i love rothstein had a line this is so great he says it feels like Cooper flag, like he's playing Madden on the lowest possible level. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you've ever done that, you know, oh, I'll set it to the really easy. And that way I can just dominate everything. And I'm faster yep. than I went a hundred to nothing in those, yeah. in those, in those settings. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I think that that does a great job. I think of describing the way Cooper flag has an impact on the basketball court. And Rothstein closed with this comment about him. He said he is as naturally gifted a player as college basketball has seen in a long, long time. Rothstein also postulated that Duke could roll out. You were talking about the spacing, Donald, and how important mm-hmm. that is, and, and surrounding Cooper Flag with those three-point shooters. He speculated that Duke could roll out some lineups where you play Cooper Flag essentially at the five, at the center. That, you know, Flag's defensive abilities, his ability to protect the rim, perhaps allows you to play him in a role like that and to surround him with nothing but great three-point shooters. I, I think Rothstein talked about, you know, Proctor, Foster, Mason Gillis, um, certainly Con Knipple and Darren Harris, you know, surprise, uh, surround Cooper Flag with those kind of guys, with Flag sort of playing a face up in the middle, um, uh, you know, like at the foul line and the such, getting the ball. Come on. I, I don't know how defenses are able to deal with that. Now, it maybe presents problems for Duke's, uh, Duke on the other end of the floor. And it may be that you need like a Mason Gillis to sort of guard the the biggest of the big men from the opposing team. There, there's some things you'd have to move around, but the potential of that lineup to cause horrible, unbelievable matchup problems for the other team, very high, very high, Donald. <laughs> so I, I I agree with you on all but one thing. I don't necessarily think that moving Cooper Flag to the five changes things. Here's why. There's only one player on this team of the guys that we expect to contribute regularly that doesn't shoot threes well, and that's Patrick Ngongba, right? And Patrick yeah. Ngongba, we don't know that he shoots threes well. He just doesn't. We just haven't seen him do it. Well, wait, wait. Ma- Malik, but, Bra- Malik Brown is is. I don't think you're going to see Malik Brown go out and take very many threes. But when he's out there, he shoots 38, 39 percent. He has we've seen that true. from him in two years, right? So for a center to shoot, you know, 38, 39 percent, I'm okay with that. Common Malwatch, we know he can shoot threes. So what that actually means is if Cooper's at the five, that probably means we're doing a five out kind of rotation where any guy on the floor can be in the middle because, again, we're a tall team and we're trying to figure out how to utilize the length that we have. Any of our guys can take somebody in the middle if everybody is out spread out on the on the perimeter because, again, if, if we have five guys on the floor who are a threat to shoot a three and make it as low as a threat. I mean, yes, Malik Brown did not take that many threes, but if he puts it in the air and it goes in, you got to check him. And that just creates even more space because you pull him out, you pull a common mile watch out. Again, unless it's Patrick and Gongba in there, you could have anybody rotate into the paint and the other four guys be out ready to shoot. And it wouldn't be an ideal. So what you can do is take your big men, 
uh, on the opposing team out of the paint. And that creates so much space for guys like Tyrese Proctor, like Caleb Foster, like Isaiah, Isaiah Evans, if he's in the game, right? Those type of guys who can slash Sion James, who can slash to the rim. There will be plenty of space out there because we have everybody who plays us has to a look up to us because we're taller than them and b they have to come out and get us because the, we can put anybody out in the three point line and hit threes and I think that's the key here is that's why I think John Shire has been aiming for a team who can shoot threes well because it opens up so many possibilities with our offense and I think the reason Rothstein specifically mentioned Cooper Flag at the five is because if you are playing those four other guys out on the perimeter. And they and you can't leave if you're an opponent and you can't leave them. Rothstein was looking at the possibility of Cooper Flag going one on one on someone mm -hmm. inside, and I, I'll go ahead and say it now, based on what I've seen of the way Cooper Flag operates, you know, against NBA All Stars, <laughs> you put him one on one against a college player, Cooper Flag is it's scoring. Over. He's scoring. Yeah. He's scoring. He's scoring. Or so he's getting fouled. Yeah. Or he's getting, you know, 18 rebounds because he just keeps missing and grabbing his yeah. own rebound until he puts it back in. I mean, you give him that kind of space, you're not going to be able to stop him. So it forces teams to make a a, a sacrifice. They're going to have to they, – you have to give help. You're going to have to help out on Cooper Flag. And the reason you have all those shooters surrounding him is because at that point, Flag is a genius at finding guys open on the perimeter. I mean, he – as as many blocks per game as he averaged at AAU basketball, he averaged that many assists as well. So yeah, yeah, it's it's exciting. I, I, the one thing that was uh, what I liked about the prediction for the starting five is Mason Gillis, and here's why he he had another tweet later on. I know you saw it, and it was just four words: Mason Gillis, glue guy, and yeah. you need a glue guy in your you starting have, lineup. You got to have him on the floor, a guy who does not care about getting 30 points a game does not care about getting 50 you know rebounds a game a guy who can take a few shots play some good defense motivate the troops uh you know the way i'm looking at this is mason gillis is probably in line to be one of the captains right like i mean sure there's a lot of a lot of choices here but for one of the of the grad guys like he he's been a, a what a three-year captain at purdue and yo, yo big 10 sixth man of the year best yeah. sixth man in the entire big 10 last year not because of his rebounds, not because of his steals, not because of his point scoring, because he's a glue guy, because he does everything. Because he does everything and understands what role he needs to play and plays it to the exception, right? Like a six man has to learn that I'm not starting, right? And they have to get past that mental block. And not a lot of guys can do that well. On this team, you're going to need to have five to six guys who understand that they may not be starting on a particular day. And they need to come off the bench and be ready to play when they get in. Mason Gillis being able to bring everybody together. And on top of that, you know, we haven't mentioned him much, much on this pod, but Sion James. Sion James was the two-time sportsmanship player of the year yeah. in uh, for Tulane. So, again, another guy who understands his role, whether you need him to go to the lane, whether you need him to sit on the bench and motivate the troops, whether you need him to come in and get some steals, he can do any of that. And I think that is where this team is really going to – uh, be successful is you have a few of those guys who are just willing to do the dirty work while other guys shine, knowing that he, uh, that, that on the next particular game, that person may be called on to shine as well. Everyone's going to be eaten here, Jason. Yeah. I, I just wanted to really quickly, and then I'll be all done with the John Rothstein with John Rothstein's five tweets. Uh, I wanted to mention <laughs> Darren Harris. We, we talked a moment ago about the fact that he goes eight for eight in this scrimmage that John Rothstein saw, but uh, Rothstein specifically shouted out how good, Darren Harris was, he called him the surprise of the day. Um, and he said, remember the name. Uh, you know, I, I think the quick release, the the ability to take shots from, from effortless distance, like Darren Harris, we saw in this footage, wasn't just hitting three-pointers from the three-point line. He was a couple steps beyond the line on many of these shots. Um, it shows you Darren Harris is a huge, huge threat from the perimeter. And I think most of us had projected him to be a threat from the perimeter in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. We just didn't think that there was really going to be room for him to have a big role on this year's team. But for Rothstein to be shouting out, you know, how good Darren Harris was. And for us to see it on film the way we did, it gives you pause. I don't know. God, I, Donald, I cannot figure out how the minutes are going to be divided up on this team. But it it 
feels like there is a case for this team to go deeper than we've seen a Duke team go in a long time. And I think I just teased what we're going to be talking about next because some of the guys on the team say they are going to be playing a ton more players than usual. Yeah, and, and just to put a bow on it, right? I, when you look at this team, right, and, and the number of minutes, again, 200 minutes. They have not increased the number of minutes that are able to be divided, but we've increased the number of players that very well could to, could get a share of those minutes. And I think maybe you look at it in terms of slots, right? Like you have, you know, your, your five starting slots, and then you have three to four bench slots. And together that totals 200 minutes. And again, on any given day, you have – you know, 11 guys, 12 guys that are going to be factoring into those nine slots, whether that's starting and going 30 minutes, whether that's coming off the bench and getting 20, maybe it's combining with somebody else and the two of you collectively get 20 or get 15, whatever that role is. I think that everyone's going to be on the same page with it, especially in the early going entering every single game so that we know, or at least for them, they know, Hey, this is my job. Let's execute it because the, there's a lot of things that have to happen for us to win a national championship. Humility, humility has to be among them. And sometimes you have to be humble enough to say, I'm only getting five minutes today. Let me go out and excel in that five minutes or, Hey, I'm getting 30 minutes. Let me make sure I can make it where, you know, coach knows that when you send me in for 30 minutes, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to, ex I'm going to execute and I'm going to get my teammates involved and keep them motivated. And we're all going to push this train forward. So a lot of a lot of great stuff out of here. Again, we just spent 20 minutes talking about five tweets. Um, we are great at doing that on this show. But let's take a quick break here because on the other side, we're going to talk a little bit more about this team featuring the returning backcourt of the Duke Blue Devils. That's Tyrese Proctor and Caleb Foster. They were on the Brotherhood Podcast. We will talk about it after this. It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Think you know the Brooks Ghost? Think again. Introducing the all-new, better-than-ever Ghost 16. Now with nitrogen-infused cushioning for lightweight, supreme softness that feels good every step, every street, every single day. So go ahead, take your daily joyride in the all-new nitrogen-infused Ghost 16. It'll turn your everyday miles into everyday endorphins. Let's run there. Head to brooksrunning.com to learn more. This year, win up to 1,000 times your cash every game day only on Underdog. Just pick higher or lower on your favorite player's stats like touchdowns, goals, points, and so much more. Millions of fans from all over the U.S. have won over $1 billion on Underdog. Underdog is offered in 33 states across the U.S. And this season, Underdog will be running a special promo or bonus almost every single day. Don't miss out. Download the app and sign up for Underdog today using promo code ENDZONE. And you'll get a free pick as part of your first cash cash entry plus up to $1,000 in bonus cash when you deposit. Again, that's promo code ENDZONE. Cash in on every touchdown this season with Underdog. Must be 18 years or older and present in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. 21 years or older in Massachusetts and Arizona. 19 years or older in Alabama and Nebraska. Terms apply. Void in Colorado. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.ncpgambling.org. In Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342. In New York, call the 24-7 Hope Line at 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE Hope NY. Jason, we are back and we turn our attention now to the 39th episode of the Brotherhood podcast. And this one was an, a different one than we normally have. Tyrese Pro Proctor was back on the show uh, with the host, C. Foss. And, you know, of course, when the season before the summer started, we kind of got that one. Uh, podcast episode where they both appeared on the show to announce that they were returning that our starting backcourt was back in Durham and that those two were ready to lead the charge and this time around it's funny it's almost like Tyrese Proctor is the is the guy who is the field reporter for the team right he comes back onto the show <laughs> to kind of discuss what's what they've been up to this summer and kind of it's more of a conversation as opposed to you know you know Foster asking a bunch of different questions of a, of a particular person 
it was more of a conversation of them and what they feel like this team has been doing. And again, it's two of the de facto leaders on this team, right? Tyrese Proctor returning captain, Caleb Foster, the only other returning regular um, that is back on the team. And it felt like more of a conversation, but I think out of that, we got a lot of nice nuggets about how this team is coming along and the mentality of this team as we approach the season. So Jason, let me start with this. I think that it's very palpable how everyone is speaking loudly about how the team is coming together. They are saying that they are gelling as a team. It's the first thing. If you remember Sewell, when he was on our show uh, about a week ago, he, when we asked him, hey, what's the thing you've learned about this team? And he talked about there's no egos and that this team has been as together as any team he's ever seen. I'm not saying these are shots being sent at last year's team and some of the players on that team, but I'm saying you can take this how you wish, and some people are taking it that way. And for me, it's just eye-opening that, again, on a team that has a bunch of players coming in led by, uh, again, a freshman who is should be a senior in high school who has been touted as one of the next comings, uh, uh, next generational talents that this country has seen in basketball. How everyone feels like they're on a level playing field and everyone knows that hey, for us to win, I got to rely on the next man. And so everybody has been building each other up. We've been talking about Conk and Nipple all summer. We've been talking about Darren Harris recently. We Malik Brown is always first mentioned when they talk about who's great on defense. Man, and man, they all have different nicknames for each other. And it feels like this team has gelled so wonderfully over the year. And it shows by how these two talk about this team and how, again, the two returning teams are in a way feeling like they know they need to defer somewhat to some of these players while also stepping up in certain areas. And they're willing to do anything it takes to win. So the thing I noticed, and you were hitting on it, um, the thing I noticed is the comparisons – to previous years. Tyrese Proctor just comes out and says it. <clears throat> he says that these are the hardest practices, the most intense practices mm -hmm. that he's had in his three years at Duke. Um, he said the team seems to be picking up things quicker than in past years. And that the intensity, the way practices are run, the way guys handle the practices, the, the type of work they're doing in the practices feels different than last year. This is not about throwing last year's team under the bus, not by a long last year's team that came within a whisker of making the final four. I Correct. Mean, yeah. Ha had a hell of a season. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that anyone would say it was a particularly disappointing year last year, but the guys make it very, very clear. Our starting backcourt makes it very, very clear that this is a different team this year, not just in the personnel, but in the attitude. Uh, you talked about the the, the closeness. They, they say they have great locker room vibes and that even though they compete like crazy on the court, they're fighting with each other hard, you know, for performance on the court. They get back to the locker room and everybody is just good friends. Everybody's connected. You get the feeling that they, they're all hanging out together and that we, we heard there were some issues with that last. I don't want to get into it, but we've heard mm -hmm. that there were some issues last year with the team feeling completely connected. Um, they talk about the fact they're playing faster. That they're, Tyrese Proctor says we're picking up full court. Um, the, and they talk about having to be in absolutely elite condition, better condition than they were a year ago. And that they're going to play fast, not just on defense, not just picking up full court. They're going to play fast on offense as well. And they talk about their depth as a result of that. And that, you know, how much they're going to need um, to play that bench to keep up the pace that they're trying to, to play at. I, Donald, I was very intrigued that they talked about a Japanese business philosophy that yeah. John Shire has brought to the team. It's called Kaizen. They didn't quite pronounce it perfectly. I looked it up. Kaizen is what it is called. Mm -hmm. And Kaizen is the philosophy of continuous improvement, getting a little bit better every day. And this was the philosophy that led to Japan becoming an economic power after the nation was wrecked following World War II. Businesses in Japan in the wake of World War II, adopted Kaizen and, and said, we are going to get just a little bit better every single day. And that and, is how Japan, yeah. And and it and it talks about not looking too far ahead, right? I we right. know we know that that empty space for banner number six is in the stands and they may have to look at that every single time they walk into the gym. But it seems like this team is very much looking at the task that's immediately ahead of them and nothing else. And I think that is that is part of that process of hey if i can improve 
every bit, every single day in some area of my game, when I look back at early June, when we first came together as a team, I'm going to look like a completely different person. Well, and I think they even said, they sort of mumbled it, but I think they even said that when they break huddles, they are going, you know, like one, two, three, Tyson. I think mm-hmm. that's, I think they implied that, which frankly, they change it. Have... Cause we've seen a few, we've seen a few of the like togethers and families and stuff like that. Yeah. I think this probably been added to the rotation. Maybe it's something they do at the end of practices. We don't know, but yeah, I did. They did say that, you know, on huddles that they are breaking with, with that to kind of remind themselves of that, uh, of that mentality and that aspect of things. And then the other thing I wanted to mention from their conversation uh, for folks who haven't, who haven't listened to it yet. Uh, they talked about a couple, a couple of their teammates. Um, they talked about the impact of man, man. And it's worth noting everybody common Malo watch is man, man. Everyone man, calls man. him. Yeah. Like I've seen it all over the place. He is man, man. And in fact, on Duke social media, like when they put up graphics on the screen and such, it, it's man, 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 man. So that is, that is his mm-hmm. name. We'll be calling him man, man from now on. They said the impact of man, man is just absolutely palpable. Um, the, the, he changes the geometry of the floor with his size and his length. They they talked about Malik Brown, who's like such a sneaky good defender. They're just like, you know, you don't even notice him and suddenly he's just destroying you. Uh, they talked about Cooper Flagg. Frankly, I thought the, they seemed a little bit in awe of Cooper Flagg and the way he effortlessly changes the game so much and impacts so much of the game. And uh, you mentioned this guy earlier, Mason Gillis. Mace, they call him. They talked about Mace mm-hmm. and... The fact that he brings a championship attitude from Purdue, that he played in the last game of the season last year, he didn't win it, but made it all the way to that last game. And they said, the fact that Mace comes in here every day telling us this is how you get to the last game is super valuable for this team. Uh, and they they mentioned both Sion and, and Malik Brown want it coming to Duke because they want to be part of something more. And that is, that is the, the fact that we're talking about Guys who are willing to do anything to win an extra game. Guys who are showing up early to get in extra reps for practice. The fact that this team has a mindset of intensity that feels different than it did a year ago. The fact that they're talking about getting in elite condition, staying in elite condition so they can play fast. These are all the kind of things that lead to one place. They lead to a place of success. And look, I don't know how much of it is them saying the right thing, how much of it is really real, but if even 80% of it's really real, um, the fact that most pundits have Duke ranked somewhere between seven and nine means that those pundits are five, six, maybe seven spots too low or too hey, high. Take too the low. chip. Yeah, too low. yeah, take the chip, right? Like, you know, take it and put it on your shoulder and be like, oh, nine, like, yeah, Jason, I know you've seen Fate of the Furious when they're ranked. They said they're ranking all the villains, uh, or all the all the guys on the on the in the family, and they had Tyrese's character like number eleven. Yeah. He's like, I can't be number eleven. So towards the end, he he you know guns down a few people. He goes number eleven, my butt, right? Like that's the mentality that they have. But Jason, here's the one where I uh, uh, first of all, you talked about the conditioning, the fact that they've been doing a lot of conditioning. They really look like they want to go fast and. Uh, I think that's real because the way that they uh, were talking, it didn't feel like they were on a podcast. It didn't feel like they knew they were being recorded, which I know they were, but it felt like they were just two buddies talking because that's how, I mean, that's the closest that it feels like Caleb Foster and Tyrese Proctor has. That's why we have these two returning. They both have said on numerous accounts that they want to play together and run it back together. And I think that is, uh, that's palpable again in this conversation. I think the one thing uh, they also think that I joked about, they said no fouls are being called at practice. They're straight hacking uh, is what he said. Um, He's like, no fouls are being called. We ain't got no refs uh, because they want to be able to finish through the contact and be able to also play uh, when guys, when teams start hacking them and start pushing them around and stuff like that, that they were able to push back because they've been doing it all day in practice. And I think the last thing about the mentality of this team that I know you want to get back to, you damn sure know I want to get back to, is when they talked about this, they said that their goal is that with two minutes left in the game, when they do that, or that under four TV timeout in the second half, the last TV timeout of the game, they want to look around and see everybody in the opposing gyms leaving because they have beaten the brakes off of them. I love it. That is what we want, right? He's like, we don't care. Of, like, yeah, sure, we're going to have games. We're going to be, they're going to be close. We want to win those games too. 
but they mentioned that they love nothing more. This team wants to be the team that sends everybody's fans home early, understanding that they just came to see a, a rock a rock group in the in a powerhouse, and they got it. And the the whatever great shot that they were going to give them just bounced right off, and we just gave the gave us gave them our best shot, and our best shot is going to win every single time. So I I appreciate that. Now again, there is a lot of things that are going to go wrong during the season. There are going to be moments where uh, there's going to be down moments, and it's how you respond to that resiliency. I think this guy, when you have the sky's the limit, when you have that kind of mentality, when you have a team that's ready to go in, uh, it, it, this kind of goes back to the 2018 2019 team, right? When uh, Zion and, and RJ would and Cam would come in and they'd say, Hey, we want to wear black because it's their funeral, right? Like that is that is the type of mentality you want where you go on the road and you go, Hey, nobody is getting momentum but us tonight, and it's, and it's going to be very quiet. Unless, except for our fans that that are going to be whatever in every, whatever arena, our fans are going to be the only ones doing the cheering around here. So, again, ladies and gentlemen, that you should get with that, get in that in, in your brain, right? Me, Jason, have that mentality. You should have that mentality too, because that's only going in, in Cameron. Every single game in Cameron, everybody who was there needs to be coming ready to work this season, because I know the team is. Jason, last word. I mean, dude, I have nothing more to add on top of that. It's it's <laughs> it's great stuff. Hey, I do want to remind everybody one more time. We've been saying it a lot, but we're going to keep on saying it until all of you have made a donation. It's a couple weeks away. We got or we got 10 days before it. So tinyurl.com backslash Duke Dribble, the dribble for victory to fight pediatric cancer. Uh, we are we're getting, you know, people are given every single day. It's wonderful. But we're still like at like something like 30 or so people on our team who have made donations. There are thousands of you who listen to this podcast every time. And we love that you all listen. Come on, people. This is an incredibly great cause. And I want to add one thing. If you are planning to take part in the Dribble for Victory, you have to sign up by September 30th if you want to participate in and go into the Duke practice. There's going to be an open practice. Just like John Rothstein got a peek at Darren Harris hitting eight for eight, we're all going to get a peek at the team ourselves. And if you want that opportunity, you must be signed up by September 30th for the event on October 5th, where you'll get to see a women's practice, where you'll get to enjoy some barbecue, where you get to dribble a basketball with the basketball players, and you get to see a men's open practice, all for the cost of $30. But please, in addition to that $30, make a donation on top of it, because this is a good cause tinyurl.com backslash Duke Dribble. Look for the DBR podcast team. Thank you. And and, and thank you to, and I'm, I'm blanking on the lady's name who who let us know that UNC, uh, some UNC folks uh, tried to sabotage this, um, but they, yeah, they were, oh, not, we were not to story. be denied. I don't even know what was going yeah. on there. It's very weird. Yeah, I don't know what was going on there, but they, thank you uh, to, to the Pediatric Cancer Research F Foundation for correcting that. Thank you to uh, our listener who who was trying to sign up for the team and found that it was being redirected somewhere uh, in Chapel Hill. That is not acceptable. Um, but at the end of the day, we ask you any dollar, dollar fifty, dollar twenty seven, twenty seven cents, whatever that is, whatever you can give. Uh, will absolutely help uh, towards our goal and towards Duke's goal of $75,000, which are very close to breaking. So you could be the team. Uh, we could be the team that helps them get over the top. With that, that'll end it for this episode of DBR Bites. Again, thank you so much for listening. We will be back very, very soon. We got football this weekend. Of course, we're going to have more basketball content and more basketball news. And as it comes your way, you can get in touch with us. DBR podcast at gmail.com. He is Jason. I am Donald. This is the DBR podcast. And now it is time for the Duke band to play us out and take us home.